Thanks, Daniel. All right. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our talk on standing stones and swarm robotics. And before we go further, we wish to acknowledge and pay respect to Australia's First Nations peoples, the traditional owners and custodians of these lands on which we are gathered both physically and virtually. The University of Melbourne is situated on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunwurrung peoples, the Jaja Wurrung people, the Yota Yota Nation and the Wada Wurrung people. Sovereignty has never been ceded. We acknowledge and pay our respects to all elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal, <coughs> sorry, Torres Strait Islander, Maori, and other First Nations peoples with us today. This afternoon, Daniel Williams, Justin Green, Eleanor Vella, and I will speak to you about our research into standing stones and swarm robotics. This collaborative and interdisciplinary endeavor is guided by archaeology, robotics, and theatre with the aim of engaging the public in an immersive performance art experience, which will culminate in a public exhibition, Sacrifice. Today, we present an overview of our research and design methodologies and our collaborative practice. Sacrifice invites members of the public to encounter and join a swarm of autonomous robots, learning to gain the trust and hold the attention of human visitors. Each robot in the swarm is disguised as a replica ancient standing stone, created in collaboration with custodians and archeologists from around the world. We are juxtaposing seemingly familiar objects, the stones, with the less familiar, the robots. Sacrifice requires audience engagement with the mobile stone swarm through attention, stillness, and movement. Our research is discovery and practice led as we explore the limitations of our individual disciplines and the harmonies and tensions that exist between and within them. In creating a unique ecosystem of robots, stones and humans and recontextualizing these in relation to one another, we draw attention to human trust, a multi-dimensional construct heavily dependent on context. The standing stones that we incorporate reflect the enduring influence of such cultural materials. The work we are doing is grounded in replication, reconstruction and preservation. By transplanting the stones to an artificial location, we are creating a new and different type of archaeological site. We ask what robot-human collaboration may look like now and in the future. Understanding of trust is especially important as we increasingly embrace digital technologies in our lives. We are interested in learning what happens when we introduce robot and stone movement that is directly responsive to human participation. We are interested in learning what the stones, robots and human engagement and responsiveness convey. By creating this robot stone human network, we explore human and robot learning, decision-making and trust. So where is the locus of convergence and divergence? And given an uncertainty of outcomes, to what extent can we achieve harmony? Sacrifice is only possible through partnership with a global network of archeologists and cultural custodians of standing stones from sites around the world. We have invited our research partners to share one standing stone from a site in their country. And through their generosity and enthusiasm, together we are assembling our own stone circle. We have commenced working with archaeologists from five countries, and you can see their names here on the slide. So Dr. Hassan Cisse from the Gambia National Museum, Dr. Francisco Corrales and colleagues from the National Museum of Costa Rica, Dr. Agnese Kukela from the University of Latvia, Professor Yusuf Bokbot and Hamza Benatia from the National Institute of Archaeology and Heritage in Morocco, and Professor Tsagan Turbat from the Mongolian Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Archaeology. At present, we are following up on leads for other countries, so watch this space, and we are working to include First Nations sites in Australia. Crucially, we are not looking to acquire data from our partners, but rather to collaborate and explore ideas together with the aim of collective outputs as we progress with our research. Where possible, we are asking for our research partners to, show for, to share photogrammetric models, but we've discovered that these are generally unavailable. So in these cases, we ask that our research partners provide photographs from which we can create the requisite models. 
these models will remain protected and in all cases returned to their custodians. We are also including personal testimony, descriptions and experiences from live encounters with the stones. These are vital to help fill in the gaps that photographs and digital recreations will miss. We are collecting not just objective archaeological data, but likewise the phenomenological and, um, and cultural reflections of our collaborators. In this way, we are adding a more personalised and contemporary human element to our understanding of the stones and their digital twins. These components inform our fabrication of high fidelity replica megaliths using various theatrical rendering techniques. And I'm now gonna pass over to Justin who will speak more about the fabrication processes. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, as, as Alex mentioned, uh, we're going to be, we're hoping to use photogrammetry as the key uh, element in uh, replicating these stones or, or reproducing them. Uh, by pairing this with advances in computer assisted drawing or CAD, uh, this has allowed us to use vectorization, uh, the vectorization of complex objects on the X, Y, and Z axis. What this basically means is it allows us to take photogrammetric digital models and translate them into digital plans or patterns that can then be followed by machines using vectorized paths. Um, although we're using modern digital tools, the basic methods of sculpture will still apply when we create the stones, these being sculpture by addition and sculpture by subtraction. Uh, 3D printing is the sort of modern version of sculpture by addition. Um, so instead of clay, we use filament. Uh, this allows us for excellent detail uh, and very little waste, but it does provide us with a very small build envelope. And given that some of our stones are up to two and a half meters tall, um, using 3D printing alone would not be an option for us. By, by contrast, uh, CNC milling uh, would be our version of sculpture by subtraction. Uh, again, this gives us great detail, but it can cause a large amount of waste, um, again, with a two and a half meter tall stone. So therefore, we're going to be using a hybrid method uh, to create our final sto stones, both to in order, in order to limit the waste, but also to expand the build volume and allow us to achieve these uh, astonishing monoliths. To achieve this, we're going to carve versions of the stone using both three and five axis CNC machines in a negative space. We can then join these negative sections together to form molds for our stones. And then we will cast those with a thin polyurethane shell. Uh, these shells, shells will be in, tain, in, in turn painted, treated uh, and gussied up using theatrical scenic art methods and attached to our robots. The methods we're using brings forward uh, a lot of cons um, considerations and constraints that we're we're uh, keen to explore. The key concern is, of course, our duty of care to the stones themselves, their sites and the cultures that created them. Taking this into consideration, our key question becomes, to what extent do we replicate or represent uh, the, the, these objects of significance? Respect is paramount in our project, and this is especially the case with the fabrication of these stones. Simultaneously though, this is also a quite a theatrical project. So we're hit with the question of how do we communicate the liveliness of these, stride, of these stones and translate, as Alex mentioned earlier, the personal experience of being there. We're committed to reproducing one-to-one -one versions of these stones. And all of these choices have ramifications. Given the size of some of the objects and the layers of detail that may be added, the stone's weight and its center of gravity is key to the success of these carapaces. And in order to best represent the stones, we're exploring the physical capabilities of the robots themselves, which may include things such as deliberate instability um, as a method of, of uh, theatricality. The benefits of combining digital and physical sculpture techniques are several. Um, combining the methods ensures the accuracy and the repeatability. Uh, one thing I always tell my students is chisels don't have an undo button, um, but fortunately digital equipment does. Um, this also 
at the beginning of our process using the photogrammetry, it gives us the luxury of starting with a faithful reproduction. Um, this helps us to greatly understand the object itself and how it may well have been created. And it then gives us the ability to abstract it um, or to at least to represent it, depending on um, how we choose to move forward. Moreover, starting with this faithful reproduction gives us an understanding of the object's character and its form in its current state. Um, I'm probably the oddest addition to this group in some ways, I think, coming from theatrical making. Um, the best way I can describe what I do and, and what we're going to bring to these stones with this project is that theatrical making is physical foley. Traditionally, foley is the art of creating and recording everyday sounds that are then added to film in post-production to enhance the audio. Similarly, theatrical making uses various physical substances, often not the ones you would expect, to replicate physical qualities. For example, we may use polystyrene to represent stone, polenta for sand, or natural sponges to create moss. Reproducing the qualities of the stones requires us to balance all of these needs of the different disciplines. What are the key historical and cultural influences of the objects and how do, we, how do they inform how we build? Them? What do the robots need to move freely in the space and what allowances need to be made for them? And what are the dramaturgical choices that will give the finished pro product its intended effect on the audience? At this point, I'll hand over to Daniel. Thank you very much, Justin. We'll now shift our focus to robotics. Here we can see a group of robots uh, designed and fabricated in our lab, working as a collective to achieve a common goal. We call this a swarm of robots. We describe their movement through classical control algorithms inspired by natural phenomena, such as schools of fish and flocks of birds. When we think of automation, we might envision self-driving cars, factory production lines, or even assistive care robots. But imagine what more we could do if we had multiple robots cooperating. The reach of the collective, its capabilities and sensory information would all be multiplied. This would unlock new possibilities for more effective collaborations with humans. A key assumption though for human robot swarm cooperation is that humans will need to trust the swarm to some extent. We therefore want to explore how trust manifests in human swarm interactions, drawing on insights from social psychology and human factors literature. We plan to use human relationships with monoliths as a starting point for exploring trust-driven interactions with robotic swarms. The monoliths are inanimate, but they have an established, stable relationship dynamic with humans in their host societies. As a stepping stone, we'd like to consider what if monoliths were imbued with movement? The agents will have a monolithic appearance informed by photogrammetry at our archaeological sites, but the movements will be driven by a ground-based robotic platform developed in-house at Unimob's flight lab. In our exhibition, we intend to capture the essence of visitors' interactions with the standing stones through several modalities. We can ask visitors explicitly about trust through surveys, but we will also have cameras installed in the gallery to gather more implicit indicators of trust, such as human body movement and gaze tracking. We hope that we'll be able to use the collected interaction data to learn a model of trust in swarms for humans. In this way, we might eventually be able to train robotic swarms to interpret human behaviors and recognize the implications for the human's trust level. We've already commenced with a preliminary experiment looking at trust preferences towards robot swarms. Motivated by literature examining trust in human automation interactions, we wanted to see whether these results could be transferred to the domain of human swarm interaction. As you can see in these four images, we filmed the swarm executing different behaviours. 
We then showed paired combinations of them to people in a survey. By simply asking which swarm the person would trust more, we can build up a set of trust preferences for the behaviors. We then use a support vector classifier to figure out where a human's trust preferences lie with respect to each behavior. This means that for a given person, we can figure out how a swarm can behave to gain the person's trust. This is an exciting result, and we hope that subsequent experiments will lead us to understand how to craft better interactions between humans and robotic swarms. At the moment, we're applying extended reality or mixed reality aspects to test the human stone robotic swarm interactions in a virtual and augmented environment. This would further develop our research into understanding how technology can enhance and inform our experiences. In the images from right to left, we see a virtual environment in which we place the robotic swarm and overlay our control laws and behaviors onto the robotic swarm. The robotic platform that we perform testing on and the virtual reality to understand how we can assist humans and share information conveyed by the autonomous swarm in order to finally test our fabricated stones. This provides another way to experience the stones with the virtual reality mimicking the physical installation, which itself is based on an assemblage of real stones from around the world. I'll now pass uh, on to Eleanor. Thank you, Daniel. In Sacrifice, audience members and a swarm of roboticized standing stones engage in a performance that explores the cognitive and affective dimensions of trust. The standing stones whose performing algorithm is shaped in the rehearsal rooms with human performers are activated through the audience's willingness to make sacrifices by performing stillness. Our stones are attracted by the spectator's performance that lead them to display a series of individual and collective behaviors. The standing stones can exchange their roles with human counterparts in the performance. In this way, they test our fundamental understanding of the notion of agency. Who has the agency in sacrifice? A swarm of roboticized standing stones whose performance does not exist outside their predefined algorithm or the audience members whose agency is only fully realized through their interaction with non-human agents that surround them. We see here the state space machine for the ritual sacrifice. So our work will be exhibited at the Science Gallery Melbourne, which opened earlier this year. Science Gallery describes itself as exploring the, the collision of art and science and playing a vital role in shifting our understanding of science, art and innovation. This may give you a better perspective for the work we are undertaking together and its intended audience. Our opening is scheduled for September next year. In our attempts to be true physically and in spirit of the stones, we are forced to consider our methods of replication, construction and reconstruction. We already exist in a complex ecosystem of physical places and digital spaces. The concept of physical space is fundamental what does it mean to remove these stones from their context? What relationships and narratives are broken in doing so? Where does celebration end and appropriation begin? Where do we situate the sacred and profane? And what do the stones individually and collectively convey? All of this is made the more resonant given our Australian context. We have spoken today about stones, fabrication, robots, and more. The heart of our collaboration lies not simply in our intended output, the exhibition, but rather the trust environment we are creating amongst our interdisciplinary research team. Our research partners who so generously grant access to their cultural materials and crucially the audience who participate in sacrifice. We cannot give too much away about the human stone robot ritual we are creating, which will be unique for each participant. But trust is the foundation of this performance, and we are all performing with and for each other. Thus, in working to replicate, reconstruct and preserve these stones and their digital models, our exploratory and practice-led research methodology allows for respectful experimentation 
with living digital heritage. In approaching sacrifice through the lens of trust and from the perspectives of the performance, machine intelligence, archaeology, fabrication and philosophy, we speculate on ancient, contemporary and future technologies. In exploring swarm robotics and stone assemblages, we are in turn exploring how we as humans function as individuals or swarms and how robotics and artificial intelligence might extend our collective ed enterprise. Trust, suspension of disbelief and scepticism in human stone robotic swarms behaviours become a foundation to, to discuss a multidisciplinary of past and futures. We thank you for listening and we look forward to your question, comments and feedback today. Thank you very much. Fascinating project, um, interdisciplinary project, really impressive. Can I get some questions from the audience? Someone wants to raise hand, type a question in the... There's one from Anna. Um, I'm interested to understand how you differentiated actual trust in the survey versus people comfort level. Um, I felt more comfortable with an image of the swarm moving in a circle, but I think it is part because behavior is more predictable. So, Question is in the chat window. Thanks, Anna. That's a great question. And I might actually pass it over to Eleanor, who's been working exactly in this area. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Okay, they're actually ex strongly coupled, and that's something that we're looking into. So, physical appearance is related to your comfort level with an object. And you have seen in um, one of Justin's slides, there was a stone. Um, 3D print and it was one of them was opaque and the other was transparent and we're really interested in toying with these or playing with these ideas of how the appearance of the stone affects a person's trust with the stone or an inanimate object. Preference is also really important because a humans are very complex and it's extremely hard to say if you put a human in the space what do you trust? If you allow them to make a comparison between one thing to another, that's how we create that association and then we can um, rank those actions or behaviours. So thank you for the question, Anna. Thank you, Elena. Um, do you envision your robots to interact with multiple people in the gallery or is it a one person at a time experience? a great question Logna. Um, we do imagine that there will be multiple people in the space um, who will be interacting or creating their own swarms um, this is something we're still exploring the number of people in the space we're not sure it will depend on how many robots we have at this point um, we've developed we're hoping to develop around 13 so there may be swarms of anything from three to nine depending if we have two to five people in the space. Thank you very much. Fascinating project. I can't wait to see it in the gallery. Are they already open, the Science Gallery in Melbourne? Yes. They've yeah. opened, yes, but um, as you can imagine, there's been some, you know, hold-ups and Melbourne's yeah. been in lockdown for about a thousand days. <laughs> Um, so yes, and we look very much forward to it opening um, for everyone next year. Fantastic. Thank you very much.